So we are going to have a group photo together. So if you don't mind, can you come to the front, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 14th Asia-Pacific Forum on Development and Gender. My name is Hae Seung Cho, an Associate Research Fellow at the Center for International Development and Cooperation at Korean Women's Development Institute, KWDI. I will be an MC and the moderator of the first session. And I'd like to extend my warm welcome to all the presenters and participants to this forum. KWDI is hosting this forum annually and this year, we are especially happy to co-host uh, this forum with UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Both organizations have been working closely together for the past few years to promote gender equality in the Asian region. And recently, we signed a second MOU for the further cooperation. And against this backdrop, we are happy to co-host this forum together. Uh, the theme of this year's forum is Partnering Towards Gender Responsive Recovery, a regional dialogue on lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the past three years, as we all know, 
uh, COVID-19 has had a significant impact across the world, exacerbating existing gender inequalities. And many reports and evidence from uh, humanitarian actions as well as the agenda for women and peace and security underscores the benefits of gender responsive recovery. Thus, KWDI and UN Women have designed this forum to explore development cooperation organizations' efforts for gender responsive uh, recovery and lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis response from the perspective of civil, societies, civil society actors and women-led organizations in the Asia-Pacific region. For this, we have two consecutive sessions today. First session is cooperation strategies of various donor agencies for gender sensitive recovery. And second session will be ensuring women's inclusion and participation in crisis responses, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. We hope this forum will provide a platform to extend our partnerships and facilitate discussions among gender equality ODA agencies and civil society actors. Uh, with the collective aim of the addressing exacerbated uh, inequalities that women and girls face uh, following the COVID-19 pandemic. Before the official program starts, I have uh, several announcements. First, simultaneous uh, interpretation is available for your website, uh, for this website, uh, for this forum. So please choose either English or Korean on the YouTube channel. And for those of you who are participating on the, on the site, please use a receiver on, in front of you. Number one is Korean language. Number two is English. And second, please remind that this forum is being recorded and will be available on the KWDI website and YouTube channel afterward. And third, we'd like to hear, to, uh, we'd like to, uh, hear about your um, comments during our forum. So if you have comments or questions, please leave them on the YouTube chat box. So now, without, other, uh, without any other further ado, I'd like to kick off the opening ceremony by welcoming KWDI's president, Yu Gyeong Moon, who will deliver a welcome remark. Please welcome her with a, with a big hand. Good afternoon. 여러분 안녕하십니까? 저는 문 유경, 한국 여성 정책 연구원 원장입니다. 원 원장 문 유경입니다. Uh, I am Moon Yoo Gyeong, the president of Korea Women's Development Institute. Thank you very much for being with us in the 14th Asia-Pacific Forum on Development and Gender. I would like to extend my special gratitude to UN Women and uh, its staff for cooperating with us to jointly hold this forum. Today's forum aims to facilitate gender-responsive recovery in the era of post-COVID-19 and to discuss ways to facilitate women's participation in the crisis decision-making and response to the future. We are now preparing ourselves to move on towards the era of post-COVID-19, but the prolonged pandemic has exacerbated gender inequality for the last three years. In particular, COVID-19 had a severe impact on women and girls in all areas of our society, including health and economy across the globe. You can see such evidence through diverse statistics data. There are also many people suffering from disasters. The Asia-Pacific region in particular is the most disaster-prone region where 75% of the world population is living here. Many countries, including Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, are faced with disaster risks, including climate risks. Moreover, some countries in this region are going through fear and anxiety due to political instability and armed conflict and women and girls continue to face new types of crisis. In these countries, the process to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic is stuck in the ongoing crisis. This is why gender-responsive recovery in the era of post-COVID-19 requires international cooperation and partnership. In the forum today, diverse actors of development and cooperation will share their efforts and experience for gender-responsive ODA. 
KWDI will also share the relevant research outcome with you as we've been conducting continuous research on this topic. By doing so, we would like to achieve further cooperation and provide implications for Korea's gender responsive development assistance. We have been hosting this forum since 2009. As a government-funded research institution, we are holding this forum as part of the efforts to mainstream gender in Korea's development cooperation projects. We're having this forum through cooperation with donor governance, international organizations, NGOs, academia, and experts. The year 2023 will be the 40th anniversary of the foundation of KWDI and the 15th anniversary of this forum. We will meet you next year as well with meaningful topics related to gender responsive ODA. Lastly, I would like to thank the researchers, ex experts from domestic and overseas universities and institutions for the, uh, participating in this forum. I look forward to further cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Yu Young moon Now, please allow me to invite Ms. Chung Sim Lee, Director of UN Women's Center of Excellence for Gender Equality, to deliver her words of welcome. Please join me in welcoming uh, Director Jung Shim Lee with a round of applause. Good evening. My name is Jung Shim Lee. I am the Director of the Center of Excellence for Gender Equality. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's Asia Pacific Forum on Development and Gender, which is jointly co organized by Korean Women's Development Institute and the UN Women. At the outset, I would like to congratulate the KWDI for providing this dynamic forum to discuss creating a platform for strengthening gender development partnership in a post-COVID era. I would also like to welcome representatives of UN Women partner civil society organizations from Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. As you all know, the pandemic highlighted the widespread gender inequalities in access to health care and other services, financial resources, and capacity to implement initiatives for economic recovery. According to the latest UN Women report, on the gendered effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in Asia and the Pacific region. Women have received less vaccine, have worked more unpaid care and domestic work, and have less or no income. Although women have been at the front line of the COVID-19 response, they are underrepresented in government response mechanisms. As the world moves beyond, the COVID-19 lockdowns, women's full and inclusive participation in public institutions and leadership positions is critical to ensure that their needs are adequately addressed in the recovery process from the COVID-19 pandemic. We at UN Women are aware that gender equality cannot be achieved without partnerships among government partners civil society organizations, businesses, and committed individuals, including men and boys. When we bring our expertise and resources together, we become a powerful force for advancing progress and gender equality. With the support of the government of the Republic of Korea, the UN Women's Center of Excellence for Gender Equality was recently established to facilitate multi-stakeholder partnerships at national, regional, and global levels. As a leading gender knowledge hub, the center will provide capacity development programs through specialized trainings to government entities, civil society organizations, academia, and the private sector. The center will also conduct research and promote gender data collection and the use of gender statistics for decision makers to make informed evidence-based decisions, including 
I look forward to hearing your insights and views on how we can work together to broaden partnerships towards a more integrated and inclusive development cooperation. And the center would be happy to collaborate with KWDI on the issue of development cooperation in support of gender equality and women's empowerment. I would like to thank you for your participation and wish you a successful forum. Thank you, Director Zhang Xin Li. I'd like to thank both President Yu Gyeong Moon and Director Zhang Xin Li for their introductory remarks. Now, let us begin the official program. Uh, I'd like to invite a very special guest, Ms. Maria Holtzberg. Maria Holtzberg is a Deputy Regional Director Office in Charge for the Human Women Regional Office, Asia and the Pacific. And she is also uh, covers uh, the humanitarian and disaster risk reduction portfolio, which includes COVID-19 response and recovery. She joined UN Women in 2019 after over a decade work in Asia on the areas of gender, humanitarian action, and disaster risk reduction. Uh, since the early days of COVID-19 pandemic, she also served as a COVID-19 coordinator. So we are really excited and honored to have her for our forum here. And uh, please join me in welcoming Maria Hortzberg uh, with a round of applause. Thank you so much, distinguished uh, colleagues. Uh, it is a true honor to be given the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, and I will uh, walk through some points related to uh, gender responsive COVID uh, uh, recovery. Um, just to say UN Women is uh, delighted to collaborate with the Korean Women's Development Institute today for this uh, really critical regional dialogue related to partnering, which is what we're here to talk about on gender responsive COVID recovery. We are especially grateful for the opportunity to engage with our partners at the government of the Republic of Korea and other stakeholders who've been such key supporter, supporters of the important work that we do. Um, UN Women has had a long-standing partnership with the government of the Republic of Korea and the Korean people. Uh, we, you have been an essential partner uh, and as a, a key driving force in advancing our gender equality and women's empowerment work in line with the UN Women triple mandate of strengthening normative support. So in COVID, that's about ensuring that the COVID response policies and programs are advanced using gender lens. Uh, it's related to our UN system coordination, uh, which where we look at how uh, UN women can outline and coordinate on the emerging, uh, emerging impacts of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the third one is on operationalizing the gender equality priorities and commitments, which is where we really look at the type of programs that we advance in uh, our target countries, uh, often with support from the uh, government of the Republic of Korea. Uh, the, the support that we've received has enabled us to really effectively implement impactful regional projects across Asia uh, on eliminating uh, violence against women and girls, on promoting social cohesion, supporting uh, women, peace and cyber security, security. And we acknowledge the government's key contribution to advancing and ensuring gender equality across the world. But today, we're here to talk about the COVID-19 recovery programming, another area where we've received generous support. So we're here to promote advancing gender responsive action on COVID recovery and discussing uh, women's inclusion and participation. And this is why you have the opportunity to meet uh, a number of civil society groups who've been working directly on this. Uh, I will share with you some of the, the impacts that we've seen, but uh, from our side, the COVID-19 impacts has, has had its 
significant detrimental impact across the world. And we've seen uh, uh, existing inequalities exacerbated. Uh, we've seen uh, undermining of development goals and progress and worsening conditions for those most vulnerable and marginalized. And we know that women and girls have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. The evidence is really demonstrating that the substantial increases in gender inequality in the areas of health, protection, economic inclusion, education, livelihood, as the result of the pandemic. It has also increased gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. When the pandemic started, and, and I've just given you a lot of content, I will share with you how we know this. Um, UN Women rolled out, uh, has rolled out since the pandemic started, 45 rapid gender analysis assessments, uh, together with national statistics uh, offices in, in the countries in Asia, to really look at the socioeconomic impacts of COVID. Um, We've really, this is how we know a lot of the content that I just shared, and I will go into a little bit more detail uh, on this. So, for instance, in the economic sphere, uh, we know that women uh, were lost their livelihood faster or more uh, than men did. Women worked uh, more infrequent hours and were given less hours of work if they were in the informal sectors. And as you know, women are very much engaged in the informal sector. We know that 29% uh, of working aged mothers living with children lost their jobs during this time compared uh, to only 20% of men. Uh, there was also a, a 58 reduction of paid work. In another sphere, another impact is care and domestic work. Uh, we saw a 67% 60 increase in childcare, unpaid childcare or unpaid uh, home care uh, facing women to a much greater degree than men, although men also needed to do much more uh, unpaid care work. Uh, women were most more likely to report strained physical and mental health, uh, with younger women most impacted. We also, the, the, the studies that we've conducted confirm that relief and social protection schemes fell short or have fallen short uh, uh, in, in terms of supporting uh, women and especially single women living with children were particularly left behind. Uh, these groups have less access to unemployment insurance, care and relief packages. So this is an overview of some of the statistics that we, we have. So when we say that there's been a disproportionate impact on women, we know what we are talking about. And I will share the link to our studies in this chat so that it can be distributed to the colleagues joining us today. UN Women is currently implementing a program uh, entitled Gender Responsive COVID-19 Recovery in India. And it's generously funded by MOGEF, M-O-G-E-F, uh, uh, at the government of the Republic of Korea, which aims to in, uh, reduce some of the disproportionate gender-based risks that we just outlined. And thus far, this project has been able to provide the following support. We, we know that over 560 women have received cash, and micro grants for entrepreneurs, as well as training on digital and financial literacy and micro business skills to ease their financial burdens. UN Women and civil society partners have also effectively initiated and led a series of discussions with district and state level institution heads and high level officials to really address gaps in programming. Uh, 
Our COVID-19 work across Asia Pacific has focused on building the capacity of national and local actors to engage in gender responsive measures to address uh, negative socioeconomic impacts and increasing women's access to uh, prevention and response mechanisms. Uh, we have established one-stop centers to provide essential services and increase community knowledge and access of resources for women to protect themselves. While we've seen the ways uh, in which women have been disproportionately affected by the impact of the pandemic, we've also seen tremendous work on the ground of women-led and women-focused civil society, who have time and time again been on the front lines of the pandemic response. And you will hear from these colleagues directly today. Uh, we have supported women-led civil society in, in efforts in India, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and the Philippines, among other countries. Um, we've really seen the importance of ensuring that women are involved in COVID-19 response and recovery planning and decision making. And we've continually seen the critical role that women-led and women-focused organizations play in ensuring that COVID-19 response efforts are gender responsive and inclusive. Uh, to this end, we have developed, which we did early uh, during the pandemic, a tool to measure women's meaningful engagement in COVID-19 across uh, four different domains. So we've built a, a broader portfolio of research on women's leadership and participation during the COVID-19 response and recovery in, in, um, in Asia. The, this is part of a broader type of, of analysis that we think is going to uh, uh, provide uh, input into recovery programming. Uh, for this, we've done a, a, a really employed a localized uh, approach, meaning that this research is supported with a national researcher contributing to the design, leading data collection and contributing to the analysis. This means that the tools that we've used really are contextualized in the country where we're working. And I want to just share four key um, points that we've seen throughout our, um, our uh, research. One is that women-focused uh, or women's rights organizations do play a leading role in COVID-19 response in their communities, despite receiving only limited support from other actors and donors. So that's one impact, one thing that we've seen. The second thing that we've seen is that women, women's rights organizations or women-led organizations directly supported economic recovery of individual women and advocated for gender sensitive policies to support equitable recovery. So that's the second point, meaning if you didn't have a woman's organization in the room to advocate, maybe the policy would not be inclusive. And it speaks to the importance of having women at the table and in the room. The third point is participation of women's rights organizations in response and recovery planning has generally and largely been in forums that featured a explicit focus on gender with uneven representation in other forums. This means that when we're talking about gender, we bring women's groups. But when we're talking about something else, we may not bring the women's groups to the same extent. So it's important that we are always mindful in any context that to bring a woman's group to that table. The fourth and the last point I wanted to make on this was the lack of sustainable funding for long-term recovery and for the role of women's rights organizations specifically really is limiting the opportunities for women's rights organizations to participate and lead. And I think my friends who are uh, 
uh, in the room and will be part of this uh, of our discussion soon will really agree with those points. We hope today uh, through this conversation that we can move actions forward to bring women and girls and women-led civil society organizations to the forefront of COVID-19 recovery efforts and bring, bring stronger collaboration between partners and stakeholders on gender responsive crisis response. We really are so grateful to the government of, of Korea, the Korean Women's Development Institute for, for convening this critical conversation and uh, are very, very excited to be part of future conversations. I want to thank you all from Bangkok. Thank you. Thank you very much for insightful presentation by sharing um, sharing the overview of the impact of COVID-19 on women and uh, some cases of women, uh, women women's program. And I think it was really interesting to see the she highlight the important role of um, civil society, well, especially women-led civil society. And I think it's a really important message for us. Thank you so much. Now, uh, for interactive session, I would like to open the floor for questions and comments. We have, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but we have three minutes maximum. So does anyone who want to raise your question first? Maybe our participants are thinking about their questions. So in the meantime, I want to raise one question first, and then I will again open the floor again. Uh, uh, I think it was really interesting to listen that they'll hear about the tools to measure women's participation and leadership. And if you don't mind, can we learn about more about this tool and what kind of indicators or uh, measures were included for this tool? Can you hear me, Ms. Maria Holtzberg? Yes, I heard you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, so we uh, worked together with, uh, 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 with uh, a organization named uh, Humanitarian Advisory Group to develop this, uh, this tool on, on measuring women's leadership uh, uh, in disaster, in COVID response. Uh, and we used so it's it's we've developed a, a full framework and, and uh, a a tool where we are looking specifically at measuring and uh, I will put this also into into the link. But what we're looking at is um, uh, the, the tool is, has been developed so that it can be used both at the sector or at the country level, and it can also be adapted at the organization level. And what it includes is a measurement framework, which looks at four domains. Then we have a self-assessment survey tool. So you as an organization can review your own gender responsiveness. Then there is a, a framework for how to do a uh, key informant uh, interview uh, interview guide so that you can do your own um, your own study and just to share I will be very quick about the sort of measurements but in one of the impact domains we look at what is transformative leadership and that means uh, ha that it really makes a difference to have a woman's group there it's not just that a woman group attends it's that they also make a difference they are listened to and their opinions are are um, respected. There's uh, also a results domain that looks at safe and meaningful participation. So this means that we measure whether women's groups are represented and can engage actively. Uh, the coordination and consult uh, consultation form, uh, forms address access and safety considerations. So that's another important domain to look at. The third one is about influencing and advocacy. And then we look at 
partnership capacity and funding. So we have indicators for each domain really outlining you can measure yourself how meaningful uh, it um, uh, has been the the engagement. I will share a link uh, in the chat to our framework for your reference and I'm happy to walk through that in more detail. Thank, Thank you for the question. Thank you so much for your answer and uh, informative presentations. And uh, I'm sorry we don't have much time, so we have to move on. And thank you again for your wonderful speech, Ms. Uh, Maria Holtzberg. Let's give her a big applause again. Thank you very much. Now, let us move to the first session, cooperation strategies of various donor agencies for gender sensitivity recovery. Uh, for this session, I'd like to invite two presenters and two discussants. Uh, I hope you will enjoy their presentations and feel free to raise your uh, question and discussion point as I will open the floor for gen uh, general discussion uh, when all presentations and discussions are over. And because we have time limit, I would like to ask all the speakers to keep your presentation time to less than 15 minutes. And keep, please keep in mind that I will be keeping the time and I might ask you to wrap up uh, your presentation if we seem to be ra uh, running over the time. And first of all, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Ms. Hyun-suk Lee, Director of Taktin Lee. Her presentation title is Cooperation with International Organizations for Gender Sensitive Recovery, focusing on the case of multilateral cooperation project to prevent violence against women in Laos. Let's welcome her with a big hands. 네, 안녕하세요. 저는 Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Hyunsuk Lee from Taktin Nail. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum to share our experience in Laos, Laos with you. We are implementing a project to prevent and respond to the violence against women in Laos. The title of the project is included in the presentation file, so please refer to the PPT file for exact name of the project. The title of our project is the Project on Prevention and Elimination of Violence Against Women for Mainstreaming Gender into the National Development Agenda in Lao PDR. The project is a four-year project. Objective of the project is to strengthen the capacity in Laos to prevent uh, violence against women. And the second objective is to support the country built a governance system to counter violence against women. And the impact we expect from the project is to reduce the violence against women and girls in Lao PDR by strengthening the prevention and response system. And we have GE Vow Center, which is included in the project. Specifically, we aim to establish this GE Vow Center. And conduct promotional activities in Laos on the importance of prevention and response to violence against women. In Laos, we are also conducting capacity building activities and developing manuals and guidelines to respond to the violence against women, as well as trainings on the uh, activists in Laos. And personally, there are some special stakeholders and interested parties. We are going to do the capacity building of those related parties and staff. This is the structure of the project. There is Laos. Our partner is Lao Women's Union. And we are PMC in Korea. The entire funding is provided from Koika. So there is Koika Laos office and Taktin Neil here as PMC and in Laos we have Lao Women's Union and this is multilateral technical assistance project which is being attended by UNDP and UNFPA in Lao PDR. 
So COICA provided support for the Lao project conducted by UNDP and UNFPA and also the project activities of Korea PMC. Our role was to provide education and training for the counselors who will support the victims. And what UN organizations do is to create standard operating manuals and to train the relevant personnel in Laos, as well as various activities to improve the awareness in Laos. This is a multilateral project. So once a month, we have a meeting with each other to share the progress we made in the project. And in the process of the project, we sometimes face situations that we didn't expect. And sometimes, when we received the proposal to participate in the project, we were supposed to create the standard manual. But once we began the project, we found that UNDP is going to create the operating manual. So we had to work on the terminologies and content of the manual and see how the manual will work in Laos. Regarding that, we have uh, cooperation with UNDP and UN organizations have their own manuals and uh, guidelines at the international organization level. And we need to work on the manual to be applied to Laos. And as a Korean PMC, we have our own experience from Korea. And in Korea, civil society organizations have been very active in this kind of project. So for some areas, we PMC from Korea has unique and very interesting experience that uh, is worth sharing for the project. In the case of overall manuals, they are created by the international organization like the UN. And what we do is to work on detailed manuals and guidelines, for example, guidelines to support the victims of the violence. And what we do is to create more detailed guidelines reflecting uh, the, what we experienced in Korea and what people experienced in Laos. That's what we are doing in the project. So COICA, uh, UN, and we, the PMC from Korea, meet often with each other and we uh, have discussion. At first, when we conducted, began the project, we had different understanding on the terms and words. So we had to go through trials and errors, but after one or two years uh, have passed, we came to build a trust in each other and we came to understand each other better. So we were able to come up with more specific, detailed outcomes from the project. And there are activists in Laos. When we make some proposal to those activists in Laos, at first they didn't understand what the proposals meant because they didn't have the same experience as us. But the activists from Laos visited Korea and received training, and then they the activists were able to see how the project will be implemented in their own country. And they also gained insight and inspiration from Korean activists as well. That helped them uh, better understand the project in Laos. And they were able to better understand our proposals. And when we conducted a project in Vietnam, at first, there are many things that uh, seem to be vague, but and also at first we see uh, people have doubts about the success of the project. But as time passes and as we build uh, our experience, we become more certain uh, about the success of the project. And in the multilateral project, international organizations and 
the project uh, management participants like us and the local countries can cooperate with each other to create synergy effect. This is our strategy. We have five P strategies regarding prevention, promotion, partnership, prosecution of against the perpetrators and protection of women from violence. With this 5P strategy, we're trying to contribute to the gender equality and women's rights uh, promotion in Laos through our project. This is uh, the photo we took from Laos. The G Eval Center is now being constructed. According to our plan, this center will be completely constructed by the end of next year. And from January 2024, we plan to hold the opening ceremony of this center. And we will also conduct training on the people who are going to work in this center. We have already begun training the people and staff who are going to work in the center. These are more details of our project. First of all, we are trying to mainstream this agenda in Laos National Development Agenda. We have plans for establishing and operating GEVAL Center, as well as um, the ways we are going to manage its performance. And we are trying to develop an integrated support model for the violence survivors. And we are also trying to provide information needed to the violence survivors. And for the victims of violence, we are operating a pilot project where we provide various uh, services and support to them. As a pilot project, we first plan to provide medical support, for example, in Laos, because that's the kind of support we provide in Korea as well. And after having discussion with people in Laos, we found that what they need is uh, rather the self-support service uh, rather than the medical support model. So by reflecting the feedback from the local people, we are operating a pilot project. The first thing we do is to develop a comprehensive support model for the victims and survivors of the violence. And one of the most important thing is to build the capacity of the interested parties and staff members. For example, we are inviting them to Korea to receive training. And we are developing and we have developed intensive training courses for counseling managers. We have also trained uh, volunteers and have them receive the proper certificate through the course we developed. We're also holding international workshops. And please refer to the table for detailed procedures and steps. We are also developing guidelines to protect and support victims of violence uh, due to time constraint. Actually, we are talking about COVID-19 related um, issues. So I would like to focus more on COVID-19 related issues before closing my presentation. So the previous slides uh, are about the detailed content of our project, so please refer to them later on. In conclusion, this, the key of this project is to establish GEVAL Center. This center supports activities of 
each regional counseling center for the victims of violence. The GVAL Center will also develop manuals to support the victims of violence. GVAL Center is going to play a role that is similar to the role of the Korea Women's Rights Promotion Institution in Korea. So GVAL Center will serve as a control tower in terms of the prevention and elimination of the violence against women. Uh, due to COVID-19, we went through many difficulties. GE Bell Center needs to serve as a control tower to support various regional counseling centers. But the problem was that institutions didn't have much budget to support the victims of violence because the Laos government allocated almost all the budget to responding to COVID-19 pandemics. So there was no sufficient, not sufficient budget for um, the shelters, for example. So some shelters had to had to have some women victims back to their uh, homes due to the lack of budget. So this was one of the difficulties we had. And the country was under lockdown measures, and it was difficult for us to exchange opinions with the relevant parties of the project, so there was a delay. And we had to invite the Laos personnel to Korea for training, but due to COVID-19, our invitation delayed by over one year. Uh, the biggest challenge was that all the government budget was concentrated to responding to COVID-19 pandemic, and there was almost no budget to support the victims of violence. Even if we uh, construct the GE Val Center, can the center really receive the sufficient budget from the government? We are not sure about this. If there is no funding support from international organizations, then we cannot be sure whether the GE Val Center can be uh, operated in a sustainable manner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you interesting presentation. I think it was really informative to learn how uh, Tak Ting Nail worked with multilateral agencies for gen gender-based violence project. Thank you again. And now let us move to the second presentation. Our second speaker is Dr. Ji Soo Yoon, Director of International Development Corporation at KWDI. The title of her presentation is Gender Sensitive Recovery and South Korea's Development Cooperation Strategy, focusing on strengthening global partnership. Let's welcome her with a big hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, if you start the slide, yes, thank you. Um, I'll be presenting you to, to, to you today a part of KWDI's research project, which was conducted this year, titled South Korea's ODA Strategy on Gender Equality in the Post-COVID-19 Era. And this report will be released very shortly at the end of this year. To give you a simple background uh, on our research, the goal of our research is uh, basically to come up with an effective gender equality aid strategy for South Korea to address the deepening of gender inequality in the post-pandemic era. To do so, we first picked two areas of concentrated gender impact due to COVID-19. One of such area was women's work and care responsibilities, and the other was gender-based violence. And we noted specific ways in which women were affected, utilizing different data sets and issue briefs released by UN Women as well as other international organizations, to name a few. And we also note that governments uh, across the world all reacted to mitigate the rising gender inequality since COVID, but that these were far fr uh, from enough to address important challenges and definitely not enough measures taken in many of the developing countries. And so therefore, we argue that more aid in support of gender equality is needed. 
And in, in, in addition, we conducted in-depth case studies. And uh, the first part of our in-depth case studies, uh, we looked into key interventions that were made by major donor agencies to advance gender equality before and after COVID. And so here we are, uh, we are looking into cases of other countries' donor agencies. And then in the second part, what we did is that we examined the South Korea's gender equality aid in the past 10 years and identified a general pattern and uh, uh, focus areas as well as the remaining challenges that need to be addressed. And we also interviewed project managers of gender equality aid. And we tried to identify key issues and concerns that emerged during COVID. And based on these findings, we de developed strategies for South Korea's gender equality aid in the post-pandemic era, which contributes to achieving gender equality uh, globally. And um, uh, some of the strategies that we uh, came up with relate to gender equality aid in general, and then we also try to identify some specific strategies uh, in our in the area that we focus in. We, uh, so one of those areas, like I said before, uh, regards women's economic empowerment, and the other area is uh, gender-based violence. Uh, just to give you some ideas about where South Korea's gender equality aid stands today, here are some details that I'd like to share with you. And so uh, basically, 12 years have passed since South Korea became a member of the Development Assistance Committee uh, within the OECD. So aid in support of gender equality, the so-called gender marker uh, projects, they consisted of a mere 3% of total bilateral trade in the year 2009. And that was before South Korea became a member of the Development Assistance Committee. But the recent data shows that the share of uh, aid in support of gender equality and women's empowerment, that has really uh, increased and is now over 20%. So we can say that some progress has been made on this front. And other institutional measures were also strengthened. Uh, I can uh, give you a list and other examples, but one of the primary examples being, uh, so the Korean government regularly updates a national basic plan on international development assistance. This is a government policy that is regularly updated. And South Korea uh, consistently highlights the importance of gender equality uh, in this document. And uh, also uh, a number of guidelines uh, have been released by uh, donor agencies uh, like COICA to highlight the importance of gender equality and main the importance of mainstreaming gender in their projects. But uh, there are still uh, areas of weakness that we could, uh, we could talk about that is important uh, of mentioning. So one important uh, weakness is that uh, although uh, South Korea's uh, aid in support of gender equality, the proportion has been rising over time in the past decade, but still South Korea is kind of uh, falling behind other, uh, other member states of the Development Assistance Committee in terms of the attention and commitment we show to uh, gender equality aid in general. And as you can see from this figure, um, we are still uh, below average when it comes to uh, uh, the aid in support of gender equality uh, as a share of uh, total bilateral aid. And so um, all in all, uh, the problem is that South Korea has shown lack of interest and coherent strategies on gender equality aid so far. 
As I stated previously, because the uh, primary goal of our research was to build a gender equality aid strategy uh, that, that takes into the pandemic context uh, into account, we paid attention to analyzing gendered impact of COVID, uh, particularly in the developing world, and the kinds of needs that arose during uh, COVID. Uh, and, and so this is one of uh, one of many uh, examples of um, evidences that we cite in our research. But, uh, but in our research, we quote reports, many reports released by uh, the UN, OECD, uh, UNDP, and UN Women that show evidence of deepening inequalities. Uh, and the other thing that we uh, uh, really uh, delved into is uh, to hear and listen to the voices of donor agencies, international NGOs, and Korean project managers working on gender equality aid to understand the implications of the pandemic, pandemic on gender equality aid. And uh, the, I mean, we were able to learn a lot uh, in this process, but I listed three of the main challenges that were echoed in uh, our interviews and case studies. So one was limited access and mobility. COVID has made it difficult to implement projects, of course, but also to conduct a needs-based analysis when it was really necessary to find out the gender impacts and what the needs were because of uh, limited access and mobility it was really hard to uh, do do this analyze this and uh, analyze this accurately the second challenge was switching modes of communication and delivery so online modes of training and communication uh, was new to many of the project managers, but they had no other choice to uh, uh, start this process right away. And the third kind of challenge uh, we identified was limited impact. And so with the di difficulties imposed by COVID, of course, it became evident that projects and programs cannot move at a normal pace. And therefore, it was impossible to expect the same kind of impact as it was uh, pre in the pre-pandemic era. And based on these challenges, we drew a few uh, key uh, implications. And so the first implication uh, is digitalizing projects uh, and highlighting technology. And so um, we emphasize this aspect because technology has become both the medium through which projects are delivered, but also because digital capacity has become really ever more important, even more important than before, to, for women to access resources uh, in, in the post-pandemic era. The second kind of challenge, uh, implication, is uh, the, the importance of working with uh, grassroots partners, uh, considering their strength to understand the local context in an environment where gender inequalities are deepening, uh, really the uh, local grassroots partners have become more important uh, in gender equality aid. The third implication, long-term planning and implementation is important. Um, uh, and that fle flexibility should be uh, allowed. So based on our analyses, uh, we propose uh, these kinds of uh, a series of strategies and we grouped them into six different categories um, that uh, the South Korean government should pursue in the future. Um, and uh, we, we don't have time to discuss all of the recommendations and because today's uh, forum's keyword is partnership, I'd like to focus on the few recommendations and, and strategies that we offer in our research that uh, relate to partnership. 
So the first kind of partnership that we emphasize in our research is working through existing global partnerships, uh, such as uh, the Generation Equality Forum's uh, action coalitions. And as you know, you will all know that uh, action coalitions are uh, global multi-stakeholder partnerships that are mobilized to catalyze collective action and spark uh, conversations at both global and local levels to achieve gender equality. Unfortunately, South Korea uh, has did not assume any kind of, of leadership in any of the specific action coalitions uh, that were launched. Uh, and um, so far, the South Korean government ha uh, has not been very active in um, releasing commitments to specific action coalitions. Um, uh, and uh, so w I, w the, the South Korea government uh, committed to one uh, that, that you can find on the dashboard as far as I'm concerned. And this one commitment regards the kind of uh, work that South Korea go government does for gender equality aid in the area of gender-based violence. So this is a very general commitment, and we have not been very active in um, uh, committing uh, other, uh, others. And so we argue in our research that uh, South Korea should work with global existing partnerships on gender equality, like the ac action coalitions, show commitment and work towards achieving gender equality. Another, uh, the second message regarding partnership uh, that we emphasize is uh, the importance of working with diverse partners. So partners with different kinds of strength. And we highlight three specific kinds of partnerships in our research uh, that needed to be worked on to promote gender equality aid. The first is working with local grassroots organizations. We have talked about this before, that uh, major strength of local organizations is the deep understanding of the local cultural context. And they, uh, these kinds of knowledge, uh, this knowledge is more important, have become important uh, in um, implementing gender equality projects in the post-pandemic era. And the second uh, partnership that we would like to highlight is working with international organizations like UN Women because they have strength in, uh, at the global level in promoting the global gender norms, but they also have very strong networks with different organizations around the world. And so in this regard, we really welcome the opening of UN Center of Excellence in, UN Women's Center of Excellence in Gender Equality because because they could play a really important role in promoting gender equality aid in South Korea. The third important partner is research think tanks. And uh, as you know, since COVID, it has become more important to accurately understand the gendered impacts based on sound data and analyses. And uh, it's become more important, uh, evidence-based research has become more important throughout the project implementation cycle. And so working with um, Research think tanks is also one other recommendation that we make. And let me also add that uh, these different kinds of partners uh, uh, are uh, working with them. It's also in line with South Korea's international strategy. Okay, so finally, this uh, brings us to recognizing the importance of de developing an international gender equality strategy. I mean, um, I don't have a lot of time to go into details, but, uh, but uh, South Korea has a general international cooperation strategy, but apart from that, we still uh, don't have, have not released a specific cooperation strategy focusing on gender equality unlike many other uh, countries. And so it is finally time for us to develop this kind of strategy and document that specifically list the kind of focus areas, strategic partner countries, and targets uh, when it comes to resource allocation to gender equality aid. And most importantly, we believe it's important that this document should clearly state 
the commitment of South Korean government to work towards uh, gender equality globally. Well, thank you for listening, and I will be happy to answer more uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much for your insightful presentation. I think it was really interesting uh, to learn the uh, research-based recommendations um, from the research think tank perspective. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to our discussions based on these two presentations. And now I'd like to invite two discussants, Mr. Chung Soo Nam, Development and Gender Specialist at Korea International Cooperation Agency, COICA, and Dr. Kyung Jae Kang, Senior Research Fellow at Korean Exim Bank. Each discussant has five minutes for their comments. And now please allow me to invite the first discussant, Mr. Chung Soo Nam. I'm going to speak in Korean. Actually, today my discussion is directly or um, indirectly related to my own personal uh, experience. First of all, regarding the presentation in Laos, in the case of the project to respond to the violence against women in Laos, is like a sequel to the project that COICA conducted in Vietnam from the based on the Sunflower Center model. This was the first ODA project we did regarding the violence against women. First of all, there were actually political, institutional, social, and human resources and technical resources are required a lot in the one-stop crisis response model. So we were not sure if this model could really become effective in developing countries. And in our project in Vietnam, for example, Vietnam didn't have the gender equality basic uh, act or the act on punishment of sexual violence perpetrators. So we had to gain a lot of cooperation from relevant governments and institutions. And once you establish a one-stop support center, you need to also establish a facility or infrastructure where the victim can um, record their testimony. And in our project in Vietnam, we were not sure if the testimony of the survivor recorded at the crisis response center will be actually used in the trials. But we went through many ups and downs, but we finally became successful in our project in Vietnam to support the women victims of violence. And such success in Vietnam helped us increase our similar projects in other countries, including Asia, Africa, and South African countries. So this is a positive aspect, but there are several things I want to talk about. Uh, first of all, most of the ODA project related to GVV are based on the one-stop crisis response center model of Korea, which is the model of Sunflower Center. And um, GBV is a very important element. I agree with this. But if you consider the conditions and business circumstances of the recipient country, you need to think again what really should be the focus of your project among the health elements, uh, legal elements, and psychological counseling elements, and so on. Secondly, it is very important to set the priority in your project. One of the most difficult to get resource is the expert resource. If you want to have some people work in the, uh, the counsel counseling center, you need to train them. But the people 
who are going to support legal and medical and police related support, they must be the highly skilled workers. But in developing countries, there is not a large pool of highly educated and highly skilled workers dedicated to this area. For example, if a society has a large pool of lawyers dedicated to sexual assault cases, then it will be easier to recruit the, the kind of lawyers in the center. But in a country where there is no uh, large pool of lawyers dedicated to sexual assault, then it will be difficult to find um, the right people. So you, we need to consider these circumstances when we select the priorities in our project. The same is true for Korea. Regarding the GBV-related projects, Korea does not have a large pool of experts. So at first, our GBV ODA project was based on the Sunflower Center model, but we had to collaborate with international organizations. That was the case of Vietnam, Laos, and in many other countries' projects related to GPV because Korea itself is lack of experts. Of course, our GV, GBV ODA projects in overseas um, can be regarded as um, positive, successful cases. But if you look at Korea, in Korea there are public institutions, NGOs, and professionals, but we are lack of the full, complete uh, experts in this area to respond to GVV. So there has been a limited opportunity for the Korean public institutions and professionals to fully participate in the overseas GVV ODA project. Uh, one of the hot potatoes in the international development cooperation community is the project to prevent sexual exploitation, abuse, and uh, harassment. The key aspect is that there are various gender-based violence and uh, sexual assault cases that happened um, during the project uh, process. So I believe that the donor country and the members from the donor countries to provide the GVV-related um, ODA project in a foreign country must reflect on uh, themselves. And recently, with COVID-19, gender inequality has worsened, and we need to identify the exact uh, situation, the impact of COVID-19 on gender inequality, especially how are we going to conduct the development projects in this uh, new normal where we should be accustomed to the non-face-to-face -face, uh, ways. So the first thing we thought about was to establish online digital system. Then can digital system be the really um, perfect answer to the questions we have? Previously in our ODA project, we built hospitals and various infrastructures, and now we are considering whether we should invest more in digital infrastructure. Um, Sorry, so previously in our ODA project, we put importance on localization, but now in the COVID-19 environment, it's difficult for us to directly visit the recipient country. So we are currently uh, focusing our discussion on how we can conduct the development projects in the non-face-to-face -face environment. And the project conducted in Laos is one of the projects that I participated in the uh, feasibility study. And I met with the director of a center that supports 
uh, victims of violence. The director of that center from Laos visited Korea and participated in a training, and she realized that she needs to uh, build a center uh, that supports victims like the one in Korea. So I'd like to emphasize the importance of people. And now we'd like to invite the second, pres uh, second discussant, Dr. Kyung Jae Gang, and let's welcome her in a big hand. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. It's a great honor to be here in such a meaningful location. location. Um, my name is Kyung Jae Kang. I work as an evaluation specialist in EDCF, which is the concession loan part of Korean ODA. Uh, for the sake of efficiency, I will switch into Korean. I originally prepared in English, but. <laughs> good afternoon. I am Kyung Jae Kang from EDCF. I think that one of the causes for the Korea's very small percentage of the gender equality ODA is might be related to our organization. So our organization, EDCF, rather than working to improve gender equality across different uh, sectors, we are more committed to preventing side effects. So so I, I, I don't think that our organization is actively involved in the activities that would contribute to improving gender marks. This is my personal opinion, not the official the position of our organization. So we are a organization that is specialized in evaluation. So one of my items in job description is so I am responsible for the gender mark. So I have to screen the potential impact of EDCF's activities on gender equality. So I'd like to touch upon the partnership with other organizations. If I share with you my opinion, in order to contribute to gender marks, I think that we have to conduct the gender analysis. So before the project starts or in the feasibility stage, we will conduct the gender analysis. However, the feasibility study members are engineers, especially they are mostly men. They are involved in the road construction. Therefore, these feasibility study members have kind of low gender sensitivity. So when we ask them to conduct the gender analysis, they are at a loss who they have to talk to or what kinds of data they have to collect or they don't know their very basic uh, idea that they can talk to or they can contact UN women. Therefore, it is very hard to conduct the gender analysis. And also during the COVID-19, Something interesting happened at our organization. So there is only limited fund funding we can provide. Therefore, we have to work with different donor organizations. So for the new sectors, we have to work with other partners or think tanks in emerging new sectors. So I think that the maybe we have a chance to let other donor organizations to know that we can improve gender equality in other sectors. But in the decision making, evidence is very important in what we do. So usually we have been involved in the, uh, the building the urban infrastructure, but in building rural infrastructure. So we are trying to provide roads or expressways. For these sectors, the gendered impact study is very weak. Such kind of a analysis is not done uh, properly. Therefore, I sincerely hope that think tanks such as KWTI will uh, conduct more active analysis in these matters, then this will be very helpful for us to improve gender equality. Comments. And actually, we are a bit lagging behind of the schedule, but it's I think it's a special opportunity to have our panelists and participants together here. So 
Uh, I'd like to open the floor for questions and comments for five minutes. Uh, let me wait for a second, and do you have any questions or comments for our panelists, uh, for our speakers, discussants? Yes, please. Uh, we have a microphone, sorry. <laughs> Oops. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, so maybe not right now because it's not the time. Uh, maybe we can just see more or discuss more about the, your experience in Vietnam and how uh, the laws and the one-stop centers are working over there and the support systems are there to address the sexual violence because your uh, presentation was more talking about how the laws were not there, the testimonies were not being recorded and maybe we can just, not now, <laughs> but just to know more how uh, these laws and were formed and how the work is being done in Vietnam with the violence, sexual violence, in the sexual violence cases. Yes, one the last, last question, please. Yes, okay. If there is any criteria for involved involving the women, let's say so in this process, uh, in which project you are implementing. And uh, the another question is, uh, what type of employment opportunity take for the victim support center when they return to their uh, area? Thank you for your questions. Uh, since we don't have much time, and uh, I'd like to ask our presenters to give answers and final comments all together within one minute, please. And could uh, Director Hyunsu Lee go first, please? First of all, regarding the experience of Vietnam project, one of the most difficult thing was that the only evidence in sexual violence cases is the testimony of the victim, but the testimony of the victim was not accepted as an evidence in the court. That was the most difficult thing. I do not know how the Vietnamese law was amended because the project was completed. And until we finished the project, this was one of the most difficult thing we had. And in our Vietnam project, there were issues regarding sexual harassment at workplaces. Sexual harassment at workplaces was the, the key issues we worked on in Vietnam project. And regarding the violence against women, sexual violence, domestic violence, and prostitution uh, are handled in Korea as a comprehensive violence against women, but in Vietnam, the support and counseling for domestic violence victims is being done quite well, but in the case of sexual violence, the report number of report is very low. Victims do not report well. And regarding sexual violence, we wanted to promote the importance of reporting the sexual violence cases. That was one of the focus of our Vietnam project. Thank you so much for your questions and comments. Maybe we can discuss more later when we have more time. So during my presentation, I talked about the limitation of the Korean ODA activities. And also this was also mentioned by Mr. Nam. What I can say, uh, what I want to say now is it's been only over 10 years since Korea started to provide uh, the gender equality ODA. And the, we have been hosting Asia Pacific Forum for 14 years. And now it's very, it's the first time for us to invite the donor organizations like COICA and EDCF to this forum. I think this is a big step forward. So I look forward to more active discussion with relevant partner organizations. 
Thank you all, um, presenters, discussants, and our participants for your contribution. I think it was really informative and insightful uh, session. Thank you so much, and we are sorry uh, not to give enough time for our discussion. And due to time constraint, we now close the first session, and we will have a five minutes short break. And after the break, we have another interesting session, which will be led by uh, Ms. Rachel uh, from UN Women Regional Office for Asia and Pacific. And please stay with us and hope to see you all in five minutes. And let's give a uh, big hands to our panelists again. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. Check.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Palmer. I am a humanitarian action disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation expert with the United Nations Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Uh, earlier today, we had a number of excellent speakers discuss the different issues that our collective organizations are facing with the co and face during the COVID-19 pandemic and things that our organizations are doing to resolve these issues and some of the gaps that still exist. Today, I wanna to turn your attention to the experiences and the expertise of some of our uh, pr um, prominent civil society experts from various countries around South Asia. Uh, we have brought today some panelists who will discuss their experiences being on the front lines of the COVID-19 response over the past three years and what their organizations have done to put women and girls at the forefront of COVID-19 response and recovery. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists who will then proceed to give you an introduction of what their organizations have been focusing on to ensure that the most vulnerable um, communities are, um, are reached out to and have um, uh, are included in the COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. And then we will engage in a dialogue to discuss what this means more broadly in terms of moving beyond the pandemic and moving into the post-COVID recovery phase. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Apurva Srivastava, who is the program coordinator from the Association for Advocacy and Legal Initiatives Trust in India. Um, she has served marginalized communities in accessing justice over the past several years. She's a human rights activist with grassroots experience in feminist legal practices and multidimensional access to justice. Um, and she has currently, or she is currently working in multi-sectoral multi -sectoral and legally robust rights-based preventative and curative action in cases of gender and identity-based violations in India. Thank you so much for being with us today. Our next participant is Shweta Shankar, the Senior Director of Programs at the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care in India. Uh, it's a Southern Indian domestic violence service provider with over 20 years of experience in supporting uh, survivors of gender-based violence. Her work focuses on building survivor-centric, trauma-informed, and solution-focused support services to uh, survivors of gender-based violence. Our next participant, so thank you for being with us today as well. Our next participant is Ms. Rabia Zakir, the program coordinator from the Balochistan Rural Support Program in Pakistan. Uh, she has over two decades of experience, including working with the American Refugees Council as a community development professional, helping re uh, Afghan refugees in Pakistan. Her wide expertise includes education, protection, uh, gender-based violence and sexual and reproductive health services, um, flood and disaster response for a wide range of organizations. For the past three years, she's been working as program coordinator uh, and PSCA focal person uh, with the Balochistan Rural Support Program in Pakistan. So we're eager to hear her expertise in uh, the COVID-19 response. Our next participant is Ms. Melina Maharjan from Nepal. She is a psychologist and consultant for the National Mental Health Self-Help Organization in Nepal, Koshish. She has led projects focusing on advocacy and access to psychosocial mental health support and addressing gender-based violence. And she works on encouraging disaster, uh, on promoting and encouraging disaster risk reduction methods within school systems in Nepal. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Our next participant is Ms. Kala Swarnakar, the president of the Feminist Dalit Organization, also from Nepal. She's been working with FEDO for over three decades in program planning, monitoring, and evaluation of the organization. She is a feminist activist who has worked on women's issues, particularly for Dalit and marginalized communities in Nepal, has also worked on disaster response and humanitarian action. 
taking gender and uh, marginalized community needs into account to help communities become more resilient. And our final uh, participant today is Ms. Seda Yasmin, who is the Chief Executive of the As Association for Alternative Development in Bangladesh, a women-led organization aimed at empowering women and promoting gender equality across the country. She has over two decades of experience in gender, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Her expertise spans program development and management for a wide range of issues, including humanitarian action, livelihoods, gender equality, access to health care and social services, um, and protection for underserved communities. And she has worked with a diverse and humanitarian and development actors, including Malteser International, Oxfam, UN Women, and Action Aid. We are thrilled that you are joining us today. We are very eager to hear about your expertise. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Apoorva for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much uh, for inviting us and I think this is a great and enriching learnings for us. Uh, uh, my name is Apura Shrivastav. I'm rep representing an organization uh, called Association for Advocacy and Legal Initiative Trust, ALI. ALI is a women-led organization working for more than two decades and uh, on access to justice. Currently, we are working in four states in India, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, Bihar, and Uttarakhand with a vision of an egalitarian society where women are seen as equal being, equal human being. The focus of our work is with women and marginalized communities. The major strategies of our work is access to justice, active citizenship, and partnership and collaboration. In year 2020, National Crime Record Bureau in India shows about 77 rape cases were reported across country on an average every day. COVID pandemic led to 27% rise in child marriage in India. According to National Commission for Women in India, recorded 2.5 time increase in domestic violence uh, between just February and May 2020. According to NCW data, 25, more than 25,000 reports uh, of crime against women and girls have been received from April 2020 to September 21, which includes most of the cases of domestic violence. Domestic violence complaints to NCW rose 26% in year 21. Ali has received more reports of domestic violence than they had been in last 10 years in the similar period. In just six months, only from one district, we have received around 180 cases in which our frontline defenders uh, responded. Others also indicated that many women were unable to report the cases because of, less, because of the privacy concerns and uh, less means of help. While accessing justice, there were many challenges focused, uh, faced on the ground. The court were shut for almost two years. No relief were granted uh, to women from co in court. Um, matters pertaining to maintenance, where most of the survivors were just dependent on maintenance cases, they were not entertained in the court. Uh, the court were not, after the lockdown was revoked, there were only general dates given uh, by the court. The court were, uh, the court process has generally slowed down the pandemic. And, the, and it, has been, it has affected women in seeking justice from the justice delivery systems. In India, stakeholders, be it judicial officers, police officers, lawyer, are not accustomed to technology, technological advancement and which has affected the court proceedings. Uh, how the organization responded with the new strategies and uh, how we focused uh, the, and adopted this uh, during our work, we directly respons, uh, responded in the cases of gender-based violence and, and around 4,000 plus cases uh, we, we have responded during that period of time. We circulated our numbers as helpline numbers so that more women can approach us and seek help. Maybe if we, uh, we provided telephonic counseling, we provided them legal counseling so that they, can, they should know about their rights and how they can uh, be prepared at home also to respond. We uh, created uh, 
resources uh, cons uh, focused on uh, COVID-19 so that the community human rights defenders, community human rights defender, lawyer, who all are the frontline defenders have time to respond. We also build capacities of frontline defenders and community leaders, also build young leaderships so that they have the support and they are there for the community. We uh, constantly kept engaging with the government so that they should know about the law and they should know the pandemic law is there, but fundamental rights and the constitutional rights are there for the, every citizen. Uh, we also build lawyers network as well as the community-based organization networks to address and the respond in the cases of violence against women. We also uh, kept on doing continue hand-holding and support to the survivors as well as to the uh, all these frontline defenders so that they have time to cope up with this pandemic and they can adopt the new normals of today. I think this is the whole strategy how we responded uh, in this period of pandemic and post pandemic also because pandemic is not yet over we are still facing this so thank you so much. Thank you very much for your comments uh, and your very helpful insight uh, we look forward to hearing more from you. I would like to turn it over to Shweta Shankar to talk about her organization and what they have done um, during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you Rachel and thank you Apurva. Um, hello everybody, my name is Shweta. I come from an organization called the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care. Uh, we are located in Chennai, which is in the southern, southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu. And we're a domestic violence service provider. We've been working on ground, providing frontline support to gender-based gender violence survivors for the past 22 years. Um, our work during COVID uh, focused on the differential and compounded impact of the pandemic on women and other marginalized groups and how we had to respond to address these concerns. Uh, I think a lot of my colleagues here have spoken uh, quite articulately and in a detailed fashion about the impact of the pandemic, so I'm going to dive right into what we did uh, on ground, right? Um, the first and most important aspect of our adaptation of our work was that we had to offer services online. We had to adapt our services to reach survivors. And very interestingly, in the first few uh, weeks of the pandemic, as more and more people across the world actually were reporting that there was an increase in cases of domestic violence, we actually saw a reduction in the number of calls that were coming through to our hotline and the number of people who were reaching out to us. And this was because due to the uh, lockdown initiated during the pandemic, women were stuck at home with perpetrators and unable to access support. So uh, during this period, we focused on uh, expanding uh, the number of channels through which they can access us through WhatsApp, through social media, 24-7, um, so late at night from their children's rooms, uh, from the restrooms. We had calls from across the state of Tamil Nadu as well as other states for people reaching out for support. Um, and so there was a multi-channel, multilingual hotline that offered support in six Indian languages as well as English, um, which is also an Indian language. Um, and in addition, uh, we expanded the capacity of our shelter. Uh, one of the things that we uh, realized was that a lot of shelters and a lot of organizations were asking for a COVID negative certificate uh, to uh, allow people to access services. And we realized that uh, for survivors stuck at home, this was a very difficult proposition to find the resources um, to access a testing center and then to get a negative certificate and come to a, a, a shelter. So we created quarantine spaces for shelter uh, for survivors to stay at while we could help them get tested. Right. Um, and another thing uh, that was really crucial during this period, um, and as many colleagues have again pointed out, was that uh, the financial impact of the, pan of the pandemic was um, again disproportionate on women. And uh, the survivors that we work with are predominantly part of the informal sector, and uh, they are also part of women-headed households. So uh, the pandemic really erased years of work in establishing financial independence overnight. Um, and they were some of the first few people 
people to be let go off uh, when uh, businesses started getting impacted. And even three years later, as businesses open up, they are the last to be hired back. And if they are hired back, then they're hired back um, with uh, fewer hours and um, lesser pay than they were before. Uh, so to meet this need, we provided uh, both immediate emergency support in the form of um, grocery support, essential uh, you know, material support, uh, providing them with medical support in case of uh, uh, you know, being impacted by COVID, not only to the women, but also to their family members. And um, looking at really the intersectional vulnerabilities of health, the financial condition, age, comorbidities, et cetera, and ensuring that each of this is being addressed adequately. Um, and as we move on to a recovery stage from the pandemic, we're looking at economic empowerment programs that upskill survivors and look at, um, you know, uh, avenues that give them meaningful work that looks at living wage and career growth. And uh, that is a really important part of uh, what we're looking at. Um, I just want to make two quick points as I wrap up. Uh, some of the things that, we'll, uh, that were really uh, positive, uh, you know, impacts that came out of the situation for us was the kind of coordination that we were able to achieve with local actors, civil society, other civil society organizations, state players to uh, coordinate services on ground. And um, it is our strong belief that this cannot be something that is initiated during a crisis and it has to be our way of working. So we are working on ground currently to uh, set up a coordinated and uh, collaborative response system to gender-based violence. And um, I just want to conclude by saying that uh, the last three years have shown us how resource intensive it can be uh, to respond to gender-based violence and to provide support services on ground, but it has also shown us how impactful it can be when women-led and survival-led organizations organizations come together and partner together uh, to drive change on ground. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your insightful remarks. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the rest of the discussion. I'd now like to turn it over to Ms. Rabia Zakir to talk about her experience uh, working with her organization in Pakistan. Thank you. My name is Rabia Zakir and uh, I work for the organization uh, named uh, BRSP, Balochistan Ruler Support Program in uh, Pakistan. Uh, uh, from the province I belong is a very diverse and underdeveloped uh, province. Uh, in that province, apart from COVID, there is a need to work from the communities on so many things to bring them out from the so many crises. But uh, the COVID-19 pandemic came and uh, it uh, add up the situation more critical uh, for the communities. Uh, uh, we are working in uh, 29 uh, districts out of 39. It's geographical wise, it's a very big, uh, province of the Pakistan. Uh, so we have our presence in uh, 29 uh, districts where we are working with the uh, LSOs uh, who are like uh, a local, uh, uh, local support organization and uh, also with CSOs, the community-based uh, support organization we are working with. And we have an other uh, mechanism uh, to work with like uh, CRPs, community resource person, which really, uh, uh, you know, helped us and uh, support us during the COVID that we have the uh, community resource persons who uh, helped out, out us for uh, different kind of intervention, uh, interventions in those communities. Uh, uh, we, uh, we worked uh, in COVID-19 uh, for uh, communities on different aspects, uh, like uh, for, uh, we, we trained the healthcare providers uh, in those communities. Uh, we provide them the PPE kits and masks and sanitizer to prevent the communities from the COVID-19. And uh, we, uh, uh, we established the telemedicine services to provide the uh, technical consultation, uh, especially for the pregnant woman, 
to uh, to provide them the technical uh, support uh, dur uh, during their pregnancy because the hospitals were, were closed and the uh, medical teams were uh, not available for the uh, technical uh, services so we uh, established uh, uh, telemedicine services in uh, uh, in uh, different districts, uh, especially in rural districts, to provide them the guidance and consultation uh, on need-based uh, services. Uh, we trained the community uh, on uh, prevention uh, from uh, COVID as well as from the prevention and response of uh, gender-based violence services. Uh, uh, we, uh, we trained the um, human rights defenders to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make a bridge between the communities and departments and uh, especially with us to provide the different services. Uh, uh, we have a trained psychologist in uh, different uh, uh, districts and the areas from uh, where the communities cannot approach to the uh, to get the psychosocial support services. So we provide them the psychosocial support services uh, online and in persons. So and um, uh, we also um, uh, provided uh, uh, the food packages and uh, assistive devices to the uh, persons with the disabilities and persons with the special needs. Uh, we trained uh, the different uh, departments on categorization of GBV and services for GBV. Um, we, uh, we worked with the different uh, stakeholders uh, to provide the services uh, for GBV referral pathways uh, on need base for uh, different uh, communities. Uh, to assist them uh, in uh, gender-based violence, which we observed that during the COVID, the, uh, so many uh, GBV cases were uh, registered and they uh, seek for the support. And we tried to cope up with the COVID as well as with the GBV cases and provide them the psychosocial support and other services uh, on need base. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabia, for uh, highlighting the essential work that you provided as a frontline responder during the pandemic. This is absolutely critical service, and it's important to note that um, CSOs play a strategic role in delivering services, as Rabia mentioned, in communities that are often very hard to reach for national systems. So thank you very much for your work. I would now like to turn this over to Malina Maharjan from Nepal to give the highlights of what her organization has focused on during the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, namaste everyone. This is Malina Maharjan from Nepal. I am associated with COSIS organization which works for the uh, uh, increasing SX, SS to mental health services and promote psychosocial well-being. We have been working since 2008, benefited to more than 27,000 people with severe mental health conditions, motivating them to create their own self-help group and promote others as well. During COVID, COSIS activated three helpline numbers within the whole nation. Uh, which provided psychosocial counseling services through remote counseling service to more than 1,000 women. These included single mothers, pregnant women, lactating mothers, LGBTI plus Q communities, uh, GBP survivors, and uh, women with disabilities as well. Not only women, we also focused on adolescent girls and marginalized community. So we were suffering the social stigma due to the COVID effect, uh, who were suffering from anxiety, depression, digitization of education. Uh, they were uh, provided through virtual orientation sessions, not only to the adolescents, but also to the teachers and students, parents as well. Likewise, we were able to support caste-based support to 50 LGBTIQ plus groups within the remote areas uh, of the nation who were HIV survivors and had difficulty to survive the starvation due to the lockdown period. To understand LGBTIQ community, a joint orientation sessions were also conducted timely every month, uh, including elected women representatives of various municipalities, uh, the LGBTIQ plus activists and local level stakeholders to understand their real situation needs and what are to be addressed. 
Above all, COSIS has been advocating to include mental health services as integral part of the health and lobbying with duty bearers and policy makers to address the need of women's, females, LGBTIQs, excluded group marginalized community, and increase the access of these services easily as uh, the physical health services are available. Uh, on uh, regards to the lessons that we have learned from COVID pandemic, uh, with decline of the COVID cases, the rise in psychosocial effects and mental health conditions have been increased. According to the data, the Nepal only has six people uh, with suicidal ideations and suicidal attempts in every uh, uh, six seconds of uh, every day. So this means that it's not the COVID cases, it's the period, it's the time, it's the circumstances that we have faced. The women have been confined to the home, they have lost their job, they are added with lots of loads besides their occupation and job. So due to this, women are forced uh, with various kinds of workloads. There have been GV GBB survivors, survivors of the sexual violence, increasing, this has increased to the mental health conditions. Some, we even found some of the women on road with their children to escape from their perpetrators. So there have been such of the cases and COSIS have reintegrated six such females with severe mental health conditions, transporting them, rescuing them first, then transporting them to the transit care centers, providing them with psychiatric services, psychology, therapeutic sessions, 24 hours caregiving, and now they have been reintegrated back to the community. The best thing I can share here is that they have uh, leading a dignified life, walking on their own as, as well as supporting their families. So a project not only helps a person or a woman, but when a women-led organization takes the lead and support of women, a woman who gets the support also gives support to the other followers. Beside this, there has been other challenges such as the social stigma we have been facing. Uh, so these are some of the things we need to raise concern on the upcoming days and hope to get support from everyone here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, the point that you raised about it's not just the COVID cases, it's the, the socioeconomic impact, it's the mental health impact. I think this is very important for us to keep in mind as we proceed down the recovery path, that there is long lasting unseen consequences beyond just the virus cases that we will need to address in our, in our programming and in our interventions in the coming year and coming years. I would now like to turn this over to Ms. Kala Swarnakar, also from Nepal, to give her insights on her organization's uh, contributions to COVID-19 response and recovery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Reza. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kala Sornakar from Nepal. Uh, I'm president of Feminist Dalit Organization, FEDO, a women lead organization which has been working on various issues of Dalit women since 1994. Dalit women in Nepal are facing triple layer of discrimination, first being women, then being Dalit, and third being poor. Uh, the, uh, the following uh, action were, uh, were done during the COVID-19. Uh, response from FEDO in partnership of UN Women and uh, organizations like through the support from UN Women. A total of 2,000 excluded women have improved the, their capacity to response with the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 through exiting a comprehensive relief package. Uh, relief package. We, uh, we made sure that Dalit women have improved the, their resilience and their livelihood opportunities during the pandemic, uh, pro, uh, promoted digital access through mobile phones and uh, social media for access of information and service, provided cash-based support to most vulnerable in uh, order to address their immediate needs. Enhance the knowledge and understanding of community and stakeholders on early preparedness of disaster management. 
The government's isolation centers and quarantines were also mon monitored and the negotiation was done with local government as well as the government's health division to make the concern gender equality and social inclusion friendly. Beside the, uh, beside the 146 excluded women were able to receive their documents like citizenship in order to open their bank accounts for cash-based support uh, through our lobby with local government. This was, uh, this was an effort no one, uh, no one had imagined at the initial stage of this project. Uh, regarding the action, uh, we are in, engaged the policy advocacy at gov government level to develop policy and the formulation of program for addressing the issue of women from Dalit and the marginalized community. We have been providing the entrepreneurship and uh, income generation support to target people to address the livelihood reco recovery. We are also engaged in a intervention for uplifting uh, in economic losses, decreasing social inequalities, improving the uh, educational access, imp removing gender-based violence and sex-based discrimination of Dalit and the marginalized women. We learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic period, the comprehensive relief package is very important and itself is a complete package for four and vulnerable women. women. So it can be used as a model of relief package in upcoming days. Coordination and involvement of government representative in all steps of the pandemic program activities is key to make them more responsible and supportive. Digital and virtual communication mediums can be very useful in conducting advocacy components. Uh, for example, meetings, dialogue, interaction, conference, uh, training, etc. during the pandemic. Hence, it is uh, important to ensure in excluded women access to these means. Women lead organization engagement with the uh, in the humanitarian report, uh, humanitarian support is very uh, is key as uh, they are the frontliners during the crisis. The management system and the process uh, process uh, along challenges um, along with uh, policy and activities are gender neutral, which may not address the diverse need of different people. Lack of digital literacy and technical skill and electronic device, email and facility of internet among the Dalit and the marginal women. There were difficulties in communication and access to local government service during the pandemic. The heavy burden of uh, unpaid care work that prevents some, uh, prevents women and women's organization from stepping into leadership roles or lack of support to women's formal and informal leadership. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your contributions. And well noted on the point of um, needing to include governments um, and work closely with governments in order to make uh, responses more um, a gender responsive. So I would like to come back to that in the discussion. I also noted the point on um, you know, ensuring inclusivity and making sure that the most vulnerable women, particularly Dalit women and other marginalized communities are integrated into responses, particularly if there are chances that they might be left behind. So we'll come back to that in the discussion. Thank you so much. I would like to now turn the floor over to Seda Yasmin um, to give us her expert uh, insights on the uh, Bangladesh response. Over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Association for Alternative Development, AFAT, is a non-government and non-political and uh, voluntary-based organization based in Kurigram district. AFAT was established in 1998 to, uh, to empower the destitute and neglected uh, uh, portion of women, adolescent girls of Kurigram district. Since its inception, the organization have been uh, implement a diversified program uh, to bring them uh, out uh, for their uh, backward situation and uh, making 
out of, of the efforts of uh, help them uh, uh, to keep uh, peace with the mainstreaming uh, society. Uh, uh, Afad uh, background I just uh, share with you. Now I um, try to um, wrap up the uh, session. That is, uh, my thank you, colleague, uh, and the moderator for uh, giving your opinion in country wise. Uh, I see. Uh, if I want to uh, say something first, uh, um, I uh, told I want to talk about the uh, community engagement. You see, our colleagues uh, they told <coughs> about the. Uh, uh, unavailability of uh, psychosocial support, economic uh, empowerment of women, uh, um, especially the home-based worker, to establish the uh, telemedical uh, support to provide uh, the uh, con uh, con constitution to strengthen the policy and the procedure. In, uh, and, and if we see the India, uh, we, uh, they, are, uh, they are not uh, waiting for uh, uh, for the uh, uh, time uh, for calls. Uh, they they are making uh, their concern hard, and uh, um, uh, they are uh, looking the multi-sectoral partnership uh, for funding um, to uh, uh, women's group as well as the capacity. In Nepal, we see uh, cash-based support uh, health uh, number and also the advocacy and lobbying for the duty bearer. Uh, first, uh, uh, we the women lead CSO, we are the first responder for the community. We know very well what are the problem and the demands of the marginalized women and adolescents in the community. But what we see, uh, there is uh, no space for women led CSO. If they cannot uh, get the space, um, um, how they can raise their uh, voice and stands to do the work for the community. But if we get the opportunity for government, INGO, and the private sector, uh, then we can make a joint collab collaboration plan for their sustainability. UN Women as a Pacific region always try to build the CSO organizational capacity. Uh, that's uh, why we are in here. Mm, uh, no one can do anything, but joint collaboration make many things. Uh, we are accountable and transferable to our community. The COVID pandemic situation is making the status and position of community women more helpless and more improvised. We want to uh, be there and uh, with the collaboration, with the cooperation of all the government sector and the private sector also. Uh, thank you for all uh, uh, for um, listening and hearing uh, uh, our uh, opinion uh, for, and uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for your insight. Very much appreciated. Um, the well noted on the point on needing space for women CSOs that it is because women CSOs are at the front line of pandemic response and not just pandemic response but crisis response humanitarian crisis response in general that if they are not included in the decision making process in the planning process in the um, in the, the forums and, uh, and platforms for uh, interagency collaboration, that it's very hard to effectively address the needs of women, particularly vulnerable women in more rural communities. So well noted on the point that we need to bring women CSOs into the process. Also well noted that we need more joint collaboration and multi-stakeholder collaboration, that effective crisis response and effective COVID-19 recovery processes require concerted efforts from governments, from civil society, from the United Nations, from INGOs, and the private sector, that we all have a role to work together effectively to address the needs of women and girls and help, um, help them recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to take 
a few minutes and do a deeper dive into the lessons learned from the pandemic and the roles of women-led organizations uh, in generating the COVID-19 recovery process. Very much appreciated all of your contributions today. You're doing fantastic work. And if you don't mind, I would like to dig a little deeper into the work that you've been doing. I'd like to start with Shweta. Um, you had mentioned the role of local actors engaging uh, local actors early on in uh, crisis response policies. And I'm wondering if you could give more insight on what more can be done to facilitate women's inclusion in the COVID-19 recovery efforts. Um, or, or, I'm sorry, I no, no, skipped a question. I was wondering, sorry, if uh, in what ways women-led organization and CSOs are being included in recovery efforts? You mentioned that one of the big lessons we had learned was that we really needed to engage these organizations early on. And there was a little bit of a hiccup for all of us in all of our countries in making sure women-led CSOs were involved at the onset. So how are women's organizations and women's CSOs being included in recovery? Are they being included in your context? And what are some of the lessons learned that you know of that can be applicable to bringing more women's groups into the decision-making process? Over. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I don't think women-led organizations are waiting to be included. And I think that's what we've seen in our context and in the context of many of the colleagues and what they have shared today. Uh, women-led organizations and survivor-led organizations, which uh, I'm part of, um, have really led the way in making a space for themselves at the table, ensuring that their concerns are central to the agenda of not only COVID response and recovery, but uh, to how um, you know, programs and response systems are devised and interventions are implemented on ground. And I think this has been a learning for us that we have created space at the table for ourselves. Um, and if, if I can just uh, give you a quick example of how this happened early in the pandemic, uh, you know, as lockdowns were announced and as mobility restrictions came into play, uh, one of the things that we realized was that essential services uh, were not deemed as um, you know, uh, uh, essential during the pandemic, crisis services. Um, so that meant that uh, as an organization, we were not immediately able to uh, you know, kick into gear and go out on ground because we were also subject to the mobility restrictions that the general public was uh, subject to during uh, uh, you know, uh, the COVID lockdown. Um, this indicated that there was not a lot of gender responsive thinking in the response. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, creating deep linkages with local actors, health officials, corporation officials, um, you know, other uh, civil society organizations and state-run support services, for example, to see what we can do at that moment to coordinate services because we were not in a position uh, to change government policy then because the whole ecosystem was geared towards COVID response. During this period, there was also a diversion of essential uh, you know, services to COVID response, which meant that the entire ecosystem was focused on the pandemic and maybe not on the impact and consequences of the pandemic on vulnerable populations. So the shad shadow pandemic, so to speak, of gender-based violence. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, advocacy on ground working uh, to create linkages with individual actors eventually led to government policies uh, announcing that essential services were very much part, you know, crisis services were very much part of the essential services that were allowed to operate during the pandemic. So this is uh, an example of local action leading to a policy change at the government level. So this, and this was led by women-led organizations on ground. Uh, so I think when programs and response systems are designed to address the concerns of the most vulnerable among us, then all of our concerns get addressed. And this is something that we've been trying to reiterate uh, as part of these conversations and discussions. And with COVID, very specifically, we have seen that with these kinds of efforts, maybe not in the response stage, but in the recovery stage, we are definitely part of the thinking of policymakers and decision makers that you know, women-led organizations have to be part uh, of this conversation. And this is also because it's very evident the kind of impact uh, on gender-based violence we've seen on ground. Um, so I just wanted to illustrate with a quick example. Um, I, I think I will uh, uh, stop here and uh, you know, let you take over, Rachel, yeah. 
Thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. And I apologize. I was jumping ahead because I was so excited to get this discussion going. Um, well noted on um, designing systems, response systems to um, include the most vulnerable. If that's where we're starting at, making sure that the hardest to reach communities, the people that are furthest away, the ones that might fall through the cracks, if we're designing around the most vulnerable, then our systems will be inclusive and our response efforts will be better. Um, also, uh, really appreciate the point on building linkages with local actors. It's so important. And I think one of the key things that came out of the COVID-19 pandemic is we were all at home and we were all making decisions and doing planning and doing program implementation remotely as many of us were locked in our houses or there were movement restrictions. And so this really forced actors to think strategically and innovatively about how to reach vulnerable communities despite barriers and restrictions. I think this is a great lesson learned to take into future crisis response and into our recovery phase. Like how do we ensure that the people we were reaching during the pandemic don't get left behind in the recovery efforts? So thank you very much. Now we can move on to the next question. I was very excited for. Um, I would like to turn it over to uh, Melina. Um, you had mentioned um, integrating mental health services as an essential part of response efforts. This is ever more urgent, I believe, in recovery efforts. And you m talked a lot about um, including marginalized groups, including the LGBTQ community in, res in response efforts. I'm wondering if you can give more insight on what can be done to facilitate women's inclusion and the inclusion of marginalized groups in COVID-19 recovery efforts. You have a lot of expertise in reaching these hard to reach populations. What are some of the things that you, we should carry into the recovery efforts? Over. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, yes, it's true, we have been talking about the women's, but at the same time, we also need to understand the intersectionality within the women. There are women with uh, children, single mothers, single women, divorced, then we have women with who are gender-based violence survivors, who are women with disability, women with mental health conditions, women with HIV survivors, etc. So all these are women and they have different needs. They don't need the same type of support. They don't need same type of uh, packages that we have been uh, giving them. So first of all, we must understand these diverse group within a ward women. At the same time, the LGBTIQ plus and the marginalized community within the nations are also excluded at times. So when we, uh, when we combine and get all these uh, women together, then it will be easy to have the women inclusive packages. For this, uh, I can share uh, one of the examples that we did in Nepal. Uh, the gender inclusive in humanitarian action, uh, we call it GIHA GIHA meeting, that the UN agency organized twice a month in virtual session, uh, virtual meeting, conducting with the CSOs, bringing out the local stakeholders, UN agencies, government uh, agencies, and we talk about the issues. So here, the platform provides the women-led organizations to bring out the issue that women need certificates or women lead national ID card to get relief support during the uh, lockdown period in, in our nation. So within the discussions, we came out with this issue and the issue take uh, over the Judiciary Committee and we got the verdict that no women in the nation during humanitarian crisis should be asked for any kind of document to receive relief support. So these kind of sessions facilitate the uh, women inclusiveness. At the same time, we are also uh, happy to share that safe spaces have been created within the local level stakeholders, local level wards and municipalities to uh, share their problems, which help them share their problems from their perspective so that we can plan and uh, provide them the support that they need. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. I think you raised a really key point. The key is to have inclusive platforms where people can, can raise uh, their concerns and address issues, where they have a chance to really raise visibility for the needs of the most marginalized communities. So I think this is very important. And the work you have done with the Gender and Humanitarian Action Working Group and getting different actors together to be able to 
brainstorm and think about what are the issues we're trying to address and how do we get there together collectively. This is the kind of coordination we need at the local, district, regional, national levels and international levels to be able to have a coordinated uh, recovery process. So well noted on that. Um, I'm going to actually direct the same question to Kala. You had mentioned, um, you know, your work focuses on engaging Dalit women in very marginalized communities in Nepal. And I was wondering if you could also share your expertise on what you did during the pandemic and what we can learn about bringing these women's groups into uh, decision making um, for the COVID-19 recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, advocacy for women's inclusion uh, by women should be encouraged and women need uh, capacity building uh, training to raise their voice uh, for their active participation. This also require uh, coordination and collaboration of CSO, uh, partner organizations, uh, government agency, uh, development partners and the UN agency. Uh, for example, with uh, continuous efforts and uh, pressures to government of Nepal, uh, comprehensive uh, relief support to Dalit and uh, marginalized uh, women. Uh, this uh, success the receive uh, this um, uh, relief package. Thank you. Thank you very much. You touched on a point that, you know, we really need to emphasize capacity building training for local organizations. Um, you know, a lot of these, especially if you're trying to scale up projects, a lot of these organizations, um, you know, are overworked, limited resources and more efforts could be made by all sorts of actors to strengthen the capacity to deliver to underserved communities. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd also like to uh, turn a question over to Rabia. I would like to know from your experience, how can we use the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic to include women-led organizations in crisis response planning and decision making in the future? And uh, you have lots of expertise in this working in Pakistan where you have an intersection of a crisis within a crisis. We were just emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic. We had catastrophic floods in Pakistan. You have already marginalized communities um, with limited access to services. So intersecting issues. I'm wondering if you could maybe give a more insight on how we can take these lessons learned forward. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Actually, as I already uh, shared that uh, the province and the area from where we belong, I belong, that is uh, still underdeveloped. And uh, side by side, uh, like uh, COVID pandemic and just after uh, we, we didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, complete the recovery from the COVID and we uh, faced the flood. So from COVID-19, we have uh, we faced uh, so many challenges, and from those challenges, from those lesson learned, uh, we have uh, like uh, to uh, to plan uh, for um, upcoming uh, like uh, for any kind of uh, uh, emergencies. Uh, first of all, it's uh, very important to um, uh, to reform the policies and procedures. Uh, by the government and take the uh, women lead organization on the board and discuss the issues the female faced in rural areas as well as the uh, urban areas. Uh, there are so many issues like uh, for gender-based violence, uh, as I already shared, that uh, we, we received uh, calls from uh, rural areas to provide them the health services, the psychosocial uh, support and uh, uh, the safe shelter and uh, for the uh, legal assistance. But most of the areas we, we uh, couldn't find the uh, service provider who are working on all of the uh, uh, services for uh, gender-based violence survivor. It is very important to establish um, a response uh, to uh, uh, gender-based violence and still we are facing the consequences of 
the gender-based violence, we, we, uh, we observed that th uh, there were uh, uh, so many um, cases of early age marriages and the people who were uh, in need to, um, uh, to achieve the, or to get the um, uh, response on uh, gender-based violence, but they couldn't receive due to the unavailability of the systems in the far-flung areas. And uh, another, uh, we should uh, like work uh, together uh, on uh, women economic empowerment, which is very necessary uh, in far flung areas that uh, do, uh, during uh, COVID, most of the uh, communities, uh, men and women, they lost their jobs and the female uh, who, who were having uh, the livestock for their livelihood opportunities and for their, uh, you know, uh, for livelihood, they, they lost their uh, livestock. So it is uh, very important to provide them the uh, trainings um, at home and uh, those uh, areas are very fl uh, far flung from the main city and the capital of the Balochistan Koita. So for that purpose we have to digit uh, digitalize the uh, trainings and opportunities uh, especially for uh, the economic empowerment and for their uh, livelihood uh, sustainability. And uh, one thing more that uh, psychosocial support uh, services are uh, very important for uh, the women, uh, uh, especially after the COVID-19. The women, they were faced so many uh, problems and difficulties. Uh, so they, they need, and uh, in every area of uh, the province, we cannot provide the psychosocial support in person by psychologist or by psychiatrist. So it is very important to uh, establish the own online counseling sessions and um, need to train the departments on the sensitivity of uh, the psychosocial support and on the gender-based violence that uh, what is the cases which are uh, coming under the umbrella of gender-based violence. So after their sensitization, we can serve uh, in a more uh, better way. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, especially important to, uh, like you mentioned, digitalize services, um, especially to close that digital gender gap, um, and also to reform government policies and procedures, and that involves working very closely with governments to build their capacity for gender responsive uh, policies, programs, and procedures. So thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Uh, I just want to turn it over to Apurva. Um, I, w with your background in uh, working with justice systems and legal systems and a wide range of stakeholders, I would like to ask you how we can best direct investment and attention toward gender responsive COVID-19 recovery. Uh, what support is still needed from partners and um, how can we move forward in the COVID-19 recovery phase? Thank you. Uh, I think um, all the challenges and learning, we have already spoken a lot. Um, the focus has to be now on the multi-sectoral partnership, where we are not just asking for the funds, but we are also asking for the uh, capacities, we are also asking for the human resources and more collaboration uh, with all partners. Other than that, I think um, as currently, the funding on for women's group is shrinking and we can see that i think the focus has to be now so that the work can be continued the work around gender equality if we want to see then the women groups need to be funded uh, and uh, with that i think uh, more partnership and programs for prevention work need to be uh, done so uh, awareness should be there uh, we should think more of building women leadership, young women leaderships in our uh, programs, in our, uh, in our, de in our designings. Um, we should think of uh, capacity building of stakeholders so that we can, uh, they can be more responsive and uh, for the better implementation of law as they are the support systems and they are really accountable for the work. So we need to think more around this and we um, actually need to invest in access to justice through direct interventions so that the ground reality of women, especially from the marginalized community, commu 
communities can be and can can be exposed and their realities should should come forward yeah thank you <laughs> wow that was first of all that was incredibly comprehensive thank you so much um i think this gives us some key steps to move forward in uh uh pushing forward a COVID-19 recovery. Um, we are about out of time, so I would like to take a few minutes and just let Seda uh, add some closing remarks. Thank you all very much for your contributions, and I'll turn it over to Seda. Thank you, colleagues and the moderator. Uh, you see, at the time of uh, COVID pandemic situation, a lot of works are doing at the community level, at the women-led CSO. That is the care support, livelihood support, psychosocial counseling, and uh, uh, also the um, uh, uh, awareness session. This type of activities we are doing, but we, we have no recognition. At the time of COVID, we see the local, national, and the international level, there is uh, many meetings, uh, conference, uh, that was happened, but we cannot take that opportunity. We cannot access to that uh, to that uh, meeting or seminar because if we get that opportunity, we can give the decision. Uh, what type of decision? Uh, the community voice, the community uh, uh, problem. We can uh, uh, we can share that. Uh, uh, session, but at the time of COVID, women-led CSO get, cannot get that type of opportunity. So I think uh, now in now in a days, it is the time uh, for the women-led CSO. If um, the private sector and the government sector uh, they wants to do something uh, for the joint collaboration to work to do better for future for the community sustainability communities participation uh, ensure then uh, um, we can uh, jointly work together because i also um, uh, repeat the things uh, many uh, no one can do anything but uh, um, uh, everyone co uh, can do many things so uh, uh, we hope, uh, we have high hopes uh, to do uh, the uh, better for the uh, uh, better for the community for future. Uh, it will depends uh, on the um, uh, space um, and the opportunity. If we have the space and the opportunity, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're out of time, so I just want to thank all our panelists today for their contributions. Your expertise from the field is very much needed. We appreciate you coming all this way to share your experience and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we look forward to seeing the work that you do in this recovery period. Uh, I will now end there and turn it over to my colleague Jiso to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, that now brings us to an end of our forum, Partnering Towards Gender Responsive Risk Recovery, a regional dialogue on lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. We organized this forum to establish and expand partnerships and to facilitate discussions among actors who work towards mitigating exacerbated inequalities women and girls face following the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic as we know it, it seems like, is coming to an end almost, but uh, we know that this is a beginning in a different way because it is now time for us to begin to really try to understand how COVID has changed things and how COVID has uh, exacerbated inequalities and decide on the steps that need to be taken to address new challenges that emerged in the past few years. We highlighted the importance of partnerships of various kinds, but I think the message that was echoed throughout is that the most important partner 
for us to, to, who work towards gender equality today is the local actors. And so for this reason, we really would like to thank the CSO representatives who took part uh, in our forum to share your experiences and lessons learned in gender responsive crisis response. May this be the beginning of our dialogues, which will lead us to more discussions and more collaborations in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for following our forum, both offline and online. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again next year. Thank you.